So this is the second uh, free response question. This is a paper two style question. If you would like to try the problem first, you can find the link to this in the Google document in the description below. Uh, if you want to try it first before I go through the solution here. So this one is a bonding question. It's going to cover a variety of topics. Uh, in the beginning it says to just draw four structural formulas of water below. Um, so obviously water, and the two hydrogens and the oxygen, and then the two pairs of electrons on the oxygen. Uh, but when you draw four of them, probably what they want you to do is they want you to draw interactions between the water molecules. So what we want to do is we want to align the oxygens with the hydrogens so that you have the negative charged region attracting the positive charged region. You don't want to draw an oxygen here attracting to that. Now, some of that is inevitable eventually that as you have more and more of these that the complexity will give you a spot where that just has to happen perhaps. But, but that's kind of the goal here is to limit that as much as we can. And with only four, it's not too challenging. Okay. So here are four water molecules. We've got the structural formula, and we've got them interacting uh, between the hydrogens and the oxygens. So then it says, draw a triangle around a hydrogen bond. Okay, and this is a common difficulty for people, but but the idea is that the hydrogen bond is not a bond. Okay, so for our hydrogen bond. We are looking at an intermolecular force. We're looking at two of these molecules sticking together. So this molecule is sticking to this one, or to this one, or to this one. And so that triangle then is kind of this interaction between this oxygen and this hydrogen. And so that's where we see the hydrogen bonding effect taking place. That's where we have an unusually strong attraction between this hydrogen and really its proton and, and the electrons of this oxygen. Okay. All right. So then, after a triangle around the hydrogen bond, it wants a circle around a covalent bond. Okay. So covalent bond, we have, what, eight options here. Uh, but anything that's within a molecule, the hydrogen and the oxygen uh, interacting with each other, that's what we're looking for for the covalent bond. And we want to differentiate. This interaction is different than this interaction. So if you're boiling or melting, you're breaking apart this interaction. Uh, if you're cutting water in half, like you're pouring half into a cup and half into a bowl, this is what's being disrupted. Whereas if you're doing an electrolysis reaction and you're forming hydrogen and oxygen gas, this is what's being disrupted. And this is much more difficult uh, to, to break apart than this is. Okay. So along those lines, it says then compare the hydrogen bond and covalent bond with respect to length and strength. So the hydrogen bond is going to be longer. So the distance from here to here on average is going to be further than the distance from here to here. And it's going to be weaker in strength. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and switch colors here. Uh, for the covalent bond, that is going to be a shorter length. going to be a much stronger interaction. So, and we like to differentiate that in terms of different processes again. So, so chemical reaction, physical processes like melting and boiling, sublimation, things of that nature. Okay. Uh, dissolving, usually we'll interact with, a, we'll disrupt an interaction with these, uh, whereas electrolysis and we're producing hydrogen and oxygen gas will involve that particular interaction. Okay. All right. So, Last question on hydrogen bonding. Why do we see hydrogen bonding in water but not in, in hydrogen uh, sulfide? Uh, and the reason for that is because the sulfur is not electronegative enough. And it's not small enough. To pull electrons away from the hydrogen atom to expose that proton. So the key for hydrogen bonding is that when you have a hydrogen bonded to an oxygen or a hydrogen bonded to a to fluorine or something else, it's different than when it's bonded to sulfur. Sulfur is more electronegative than hydrogen. It's going to withdraw some electron density. 
But keep in mind, the hydrogen is one proton and one electron. So if you have something like oxygen there, and you can really expose that proton where there's all the electron densities over here, something else can then have an extremely strong attraction to that. There's no other electrons around there shielding or interacting with anything. So you can get an unusually strong interaction if you have the right thing next to it. Sulfur is not that thing. Only oxygen, fluorine, nitrogen. And there are some other instances where something else might be able to do that as well. Um, but, but those three are the ones that principally we look at in, in regular introductory chemistry uh, as the ones being able to cause that particularly large uh, dipole formation. Okay, now from there we're going to go from pictorial diagrams into something that's a little more complicated. So now we're looking at Lewis structures for sulfate and we're looking for the one that shows the least amount of formal charge possible and one that does not violate the octet rule. Okay, so for the least formal charge you want to minimize the formal charge on sulfate, you need to have two single bonds and two double bonds. It does not matter where they are. So you can have double, double, single, 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 double, double, single, single, double, double, it doesn't matter. As long as you have two of each, you will get the least amount of formal charge. Let's go through those formal charges in a second here. So and we have a charged ion here, so, so for convention's sake, we're going to put brackets around it, and the total charge is 2 minus. The formal charge has to add up to the 2 minus. So we have zero, let's do a different color here, let's go with some yellow. We have zero formal charge on this oxygen. A minus one here, a minus one here, zero here, and zero there. Now that is the minimum amount of formal charge I can have on my sulfate Lewis structure. Okay. Um, then, the next one it asked for was not violating Lewis, or uh, the octet. So the octet is satisfied. In that case, we're going to have all single bonds. And if you do a mathematic approach to how many bonds should I have, this is what you will come up with. I guess I should fill these in so you can see them. So in this case, now I have a lot of formal charge, but I did also satisfy the octet, which is not completely valueless worthless. Uh, so that you will see some of this Lewis structure configured into the overall nature of this molecule, our ion. Uh, and again, we have a 2 minus charge. Now, for the formal charge on this, every time you have that single bond to an oxygen with six electrons, that's a minus one. And then the sulfur here has one, two, three, four electrons around it instead of six. So it's missing two. So that's a lot of formal charge. So from a formal charge standpoint, we've really done a bad job here. This is much superior. However, this does also meet the octet requirements. And so, and so we'll see some of both. Okay. Now, I'm going to go ahead and, and skip ahead to part three here. Um, put two and three together. Uh, part three says draw a resonance structure of SO2. There are two answers possible for that. One is where you have some formal charge. It's like this. Okay. Um, get rid of that. So, and then the formal charge would be a plus here and a minus here. The other answer you could have is just no formal charge, just two double bonds on the oxygens and sulfur, and then two electrons there. So, Part two says, why can't the formal charge be zero on all of the atoms involved in sulfate? The answer to that is, there's two. One is, is that your formal charge adds up to be the charge. So the sum of all your formal charges equals your charge. So since the charge of this is not zero, formal charge is not going to be able to add up. The actual logistics of that is that there are there's just too many electrons here. There's no way to distribute all these electrons, so there's not a formal charge on any of the atoms by virtue of having two extra electrons compared to the number of protons. Uh, so we have, what, um, 32 and 16, so we have 48 protons here, so we're going to have 50 electrons. There's no way for me to distribute those so that something doesn't have more electrons than protons. It's just impossible. Okay. Um, and then in part three, we have our resonance structure here. Now, these drawings are going to later be dealt with in questions four and five, so I'm going to save it for a second. Question four, rather, sorry. Would you expect the bond lengths to be longer in SO4 2 minus or SO2 just to fire your answer? 
So in the sulfate, we're looking at resonance structures that kind of vary between this and this. We might have a single double bond and three sing or sorry, we might have one double bond, three single bonds. More than likely, we'll probably have two double bonds, two single bonds for the biggest contributor to our overall molecular being. Uh, but we do also have all four single bonds. On the other side, this is probably our best resonance structure, so two double bonds. Uh, but we do also have one that has a single and a double. So, so in my analysis of this, what I would say is that the extreme ends of these two molecules are sulfate, you have a one to one single to double ratio. So over here in our lowest structure we have one single for each double. And then in our extreme over here, we also have one single for each double. Which gives us a starting point to easily compare these two. We're starting at the same point, okay? starting at the same bond line. But then we look at the other contributors to this. This one has one that has all single bonds which is going to give a larger weight to the single bond character on sulfate. Whereas on SO2, really our better Lewis structure has all double bonds. So for this one, we're going to carry more weight with the double bonds in that particular Lewis structure. So what we're going to see then is that the SO2 is going to have a shorter bond length because it has more double bond character on average. And the sulfate will be longer in bond length because it has more single bond character. So the single bond, of course, is a longer bond. The double bond is a shorter bond. So when we look at all of the Lewis structures that we can compile into a set of resonance structures, we're seeing some double bond character and some kind of split in the middle. But in this one, we're seeing some split in the middle, and then we go in the opposite direction. We go towards a longer bond. So we're going to see that these bond lengths, when we actually look at the molecule, we expect them to be longer for sulfate and to be shorter for SO2. And probably somewhat significantly so, because I would expect this to be the major resonance contributor, and I would expect this to be the major resonance contributor. So if you adjust the answer to the question based off of this versus this, that would have been fine. If you had done this Lewis structure, you would have had to have drawn this in to be able to differentiate the two. Okay. And if you were starting with this as your primary, these would be very similar. Uh, with this as your primary, this is going to be shorter than this by a substantial amount, a noticeable amount. Okay.